Our minds are incredibly diverse machines, capable of processing information at a thousand times per second. And even more incredible, between all seven billion of us, no two minds are the same. Yet, we are continually surprised when we discover that someone else's mind functions differently. As a person living with learning disabilities, this is a fact I, and many others like me, are starkly aware of. Look at what I'm doing. I remember my school telling me when I was younger that because of my learning disabilities, it shouldn't have been possible for me to read. If that turned out to be wrong, what else are we missing? In 1973, a law was passed to protect people with disabilities from discrimination. 504, or 504 code, refers to a section of this law, designed to give disabled students the opportunity to perform just as well as any other student. But what exactly does this mean? So 504 means to me um, accommodations under... <laughs> um, well, <laughs> That's a hard one. Uh, 504 is basically just um, uh, it's like an object, to, um, like a paper that um, helps. It just allows me to get uh, s special accommodations to uh, allow me to understand reading better and to allow me a little more time to write papers if I have to handwrite them. And it allows me to type things because I can type faster than I write. Uh, 504 means that uh, I just need to be aware that things might be a little different for the student and so um, make accommodations to make sure that they are getting uh, what they need in order to be successful in my classroom. Okay, well my mom used to be a special ed teacher so she had to do a lot with this and usually it's just when like a specific student has a special like plan or accommodations that they need and the school helps to provide for them or the school is supposed to help to provide them. That's a really broad term and again it's a broad term just like disability is a broad term because 504 in the literal sense it's a program where um, you put accommodations into place in order to make sure that someone has the ability, the opportunity um, to be successful. As you can see, schools have their work cut out for them. To understand the situation surrounding learning disabilities in schools, we have to understand the disabilities themselves. So my child has ADHD and she has a cognitive disconnect, um, meaning that she has a difficult time um, with her comprehension, uh, retaining information, and then dictating information back. Well, I have dyslexia and basically what that does is um, when I'm reading um, some letters, it, it just doesn't quite comprehend as easily. Um, that's my main one is uh, reading comprehension. Um, and also um, what happens is I end up writing like in chunks because my, my head, I start thinking too fast for my hand to write. And that's basically what happens. So like I write and it's like doesn't flow together as um, other people's does. Well, learning disabilities are, in general, anything that's going to um, affect how information is processed, um, whether it's um, specifically for auditory learning um, or uh, reading or, um, yeah, that's basically in general, yeah. I don't care. I need to, okay, I need to like think about this more. Because I, I mean, it's like if somebody has a hard time doing something in school, yeah, is that the answer you're looking for? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not qualified to answer this question. <laughs> That's the point, Michaela. Okay, and so the term learning disability I think is a really big and vague term because it's different for so many people and it manifests itself so differently. Um, and so in general terms, I would just say that anything that in some way, shape, or form inhibits a student's ability to learn. Because of the sheer diversity of learning disabilities and its close ties to special education, it can be difficult for others to respond properly to people with disabilities, particularly if they have had no exposure whatsoever, either through their own experience or experiences of people they know. So we have 
quiet time when we do our homework. Um, she is medicated, so she uh, only only has about an hour after she gets out of school that we really have her um, full identified attention. Um, so we have to have the room really, really quiet. Uh, we usually have to break it in, in segments because after so long she gets really tired and doesn't want to do anymore, so she gets frustrated. Um, other than that, I mean, most of her most of her work is modified, so she doesn't have like the full workload that most kids would have. Uh, well, I think other people will respond to it in different ways depending on whether they knew me for a while or not, and whether they like truly know me. And like, if you don't really know me, it's kind of just like, why are you telling me this? But if you really know me, um, some people are surprised because I read so fast. Uh, well, so depending on what the disability is, um, one of the most common ones is uh, dyslexia. And so um, for that in particular, often we'll have um, option for uh, things being read to them or um, uh, extended time you know, for reading on your own. Or the big one that is made a lot easier with technology is being able to do everything on um, uh, do everything digitally on computers and typing is a lot easier instead of writing. Well, if they need help, you should probably try to help them, but it doesn't really like affect like them as a person, just maybe they need more time to do something. As a principal, it's more so, I'm not in the classroom, so it's more so now that I'm overseeing processes and procedures and making sure that they're in place and they're effective and they're happening um, consistently and constantly and happening to standard. So now it's more so a matter of training people, making sure they have sufficient training, making sure that um, they can notice what's going on in class. Now it's a matter about empowering other people to make sure they're doing the right thing when it comes to accommodations. And yet, despite the measures in place to give students under 504 protection and opportunities, many are still not completely aware of what it can do for them or what it means for them. There are 504 students with accommodations who simply refuse to use them out of fear of being alienated by their peers. Or else, students who don't speak up to remind the teacher that they have an accommodation and end up not using it simply so that they won't cause a scene or interrupt the class. Throughout my education, I've had to grapple with both of these situations, and one's far worse. In what can probably be described as a 504 student's worst nightmare, I have been in a situation where a teacher tried to talk me out of using my accommodations and attempted to make it more difficult for me to use them. Because I had been self-advocating my 504 accommodations for years already, I was able to handle the situation, but many students in these kinds of situations are not so lucky and are therefore barred from exercising their legal right. The phrase self-advocating is key to fixing these kinds of situations. Teachers, parents, and administrators can do a lot, but ultimately when a student stands up for themselves and insists on getting the help they need, whatever they feel that may be, it's a much more powerful thing. And you can help. Yes, you sitting there worried about GPAs and trying to beat the school at its own game, when there's a whole group of people fighting just to get the chance to play. Regardless if you have a learning disability or not, everyone can help. And here's some tips to start. Don't interrogate the guy in your history class who gets to use a laptop on essays when the rest of the class doesn't. Believe me, he knows he's the only one with a laptop. No need to point it out. If a friend is having difficulties getting their accommodations in class, encourage them to self-advocate for themselves so that they will be able to handle the situation and the next one, because more than likely, there will be another one. And above all else, remember this. <laughs>